please open your Bibles now to 2 Timothy chapter 2, the second chapter of 2 Timothy in your Schofield Reference Bible, page 1280. We'll be reading verses 5 through 12, the 12th verse is the text verse for this morning's message. We'll read the verses responsibly. Once more, 2 Timothy chapter 2, page 1280 in your Schofield Bible. Verses 5 through 12. Let's stand, please, all of us standing as is our custom here at First Baptist. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. And let's pray. Father, it's a good day. It's a good day any time we're able to be up and about and in the church house. We thank you for our church. And it's a good day because we get to once again hear the word of God preached. What a fortunate people we are. We have this as not just an occasion or thing, but uh, it's a regular thing here. Service by service, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, a man of God preaches the word of God, and we are blessed. Thank you. And we pray for your help and your blessing and your power in the service this morning once again. And, and of course, bless our preacher. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak this morning on that verse, one little line in 2 Timothy. The Apostle Paul had listed something about his sufferings. In fact, he made mention as to why he had suffered. He said, I've suffered so that you could get saved. That's what he said. And then he made a little statement. That's my text this morning and also the title of my message. If we suffer, we shall also reign. What that means is this. If we suffer, we shall also conquer. Now, let's, let's, take, let's, let's, let's turn it around. If we do not suffer, we will not conquer. If you don't fight, you can't win the fight. If you don't run the race, you can't win the race. I'm going to ask you to put your pens and pencils up and let me preach to your heart this morning. I want to help you. I believe I can with a message I'm going to give you. My heart is heavy this morning because of the news that I've heard about so many people. Uh, Mrs. Harrington having cancer surgery. Uh, Mrs. Graves' grandson killed in a car wreck. Russell Laity having cancer, inoperable cancer of the lungs. Uh, folks, this is a world of travail. The whole creation grown up and travailed together. Let me talk to you this morning. I could call this Why Struggles and Burdens. I'm calling it, if we suffer, we shall also reign. Our Heavenly Father, bless me as I speak today to the hearts of our dear people. I can almost hear the sobs. I can almost see the tears falling like a river from our people this morning. I pray you'd help the pastor today to encourage the hearts and lift the spirits of God's people, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you to listen carefully as I try to help you in a pastoral kind of a sermon this morning. I'll repeat one little illustration I used in my Sunday school class because I have to to make clear what I'm going to speak about. We took a little cruise. On a cruise, uh, it's very interesting. You, you pay for the cruise, and that includes your place, your room. It also includes all your meals. And there's food everywhere. 
Everett. Miss Howells gained 35 pounds in one week. There is food everywhere. And you, you don't have to pay for anything. Well, of course, you pay for the cruise. But <laughs> Miss Howells said, we can, everything's free. I said, for you, baby, it's free, but not me. And, uh, but, but I mean, uh, no joke. They have a, a breakfast. You can go to the big dining hall for breakfast. And uh, then at the same time they have the big dining hall, they have a breakfast buffet where they have everything imaginable, maybe eight or ten different kinds of meat and, uh, and scrambled eggs and fried eggs and waffles and French toast and sausage and, uh, and ham and bacon and cereal, all kinds of cereal and sweet rolls and bagels and donuts and let's stand for our closing prayer and go home. But, but I mean, that's, that's for breakfast. And uh, then after you have breakfast, uh, you can go, the pizza place opens. You can go get pizza. And you walk up, and this pizza is just laying on the counter. You just get it all you want. Take off and eat it. That's this, 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 and free, free, free to her. And, and then, then, then there's also a hamburger place open. And if you want to ha- go get a hamburger. And then, then uh, a big lunch. And in the afternoon, a tea where they serve uh, uh, finger sandwiches and, and, and cookies and coffee and sweet rolls. And then go back that night. And then there's a buffet at 11.30 at night. We didn't get any sleep at all, folks. And uh, a buffet at 11.30 at night. And it's unbelievable. But here's the thing about it. They assign you a seat in the dining room. Now, you can eat in the dining room for breakfast. You can eat in the dining room for lunch. And dinner. We chose to just eat there for dinner. But the interesting thing is you don't get the table by yourself. You, you have to sit with just whoever they, they assign seats. You don't know who you're going to sit with. Well, on Tuesday, Monday night, nobody showed up to sit at our table. But the, this Tuesday night, it had a, uh, two other couples. And they were big shots. I mean, uh, they, uh, one of them was a successful businessman. And uh, his, his, his name was... Uh, uh, George, she called him George. His name was John, really, but it's pretty close. And uh, with her southern accent, when she says John, it sounds like George anyway. And so uh, John was, was his, he and his wife, and and it so happened that both of them, uh, John was sitting over here with his wife, and then came the next fellow. His name was Jim, and so John said, "My name is John Hart." And I said, "My name is Jack Hiles," and and uh, this is Miss Hiles. He said, this is Mrs. Hart. And uh, I said, where are you from? He said, Richmond, Virginia. Where are you from? I said, we're ha- Hammond, Indiana. I live in Munster, work in Hammond. And then walked up the next couple. And uh, he said, my name is uh, Dr. Jim Wolf. He was a surgeon. He was uh, taught in the medical uh, uh, school at Northwestern University. And not only that, he, was, uh, he, had, he had performed over 1,000 kidney transplants. And uh, now was working for the government in the, uh, when, you, when you give your heart to somebody else after you die, organ donor. He's in charge of a big organ donor thing, uh, working for the government, and a big doctor. So they were sitting there talking, and Ms. Howell's now sitting here, you know. And So, uh, uh, so J- Jim, Dr. Jim said to, to John, or George, said, uh, uh, where are you from? He said, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Lo and behold, they both lived in the same neighborhood in Richmond, Virginia, and never met each other. So we were left out. We were sitting over here like two bumps on a log, and we're bigger bumps than they were on Tuesday now. But, but we were sitting over there, and so they got talking. And these were rich people. And so the doctor said, Oh, he said, uh, we were in a certain, certain place, you know. We, we were in Norway. And, and, and John said, Yes, and we've been there also. And uh, then the doctor said, yes, we, we, we were, remember, remember that wonderful vacation, honey, that we had in Switzerland? And, uh, and uh, uh, John said, yes, we've been to Switzerland also. His house and I have been anywhere except Indiana Harbor. And we're sitting over there, and we were getting intimidated. And so uh, I looked in his house, I winked at her, and I said, watch me. So she got ready for it. It so happens that I had preached 21 consecutive years in in Alaska. And I said, when they quieted down, I said real loud, I said, honey, you know, this is my 22nd trip to Alaska. 
boy, George and Jim, I mean, John and Jim, they, they looked over there, and Dr. Jim said, You've been to Alaska 21 times? Yeah. I didn't, he didn't know I was just there to preach and came back home. You know, all I saw was the airport and the motel and the church building. Yeah. I went every year, 21 straight years. I said, honey, I said, does this seem to remind you of the Grecian Isles? I don't know what the Grecian Isles look like, but it's what I think the Grecian Isles look like. And uh, we've been there one time on a trip to the Holy Land, but down Dallas and Fort Worth visiting. And uh, so, boy, it wasn't long till we had them intimidated because of our world travels. But interesting thing, we found out that the businessman's wife had just had cancer surgery and it was a heartbreak. We found out after just a little later that Dr. Jim Wolf, the surgeon and, and a man of tremendous prestige in the country, Dr. Wolf has had three severe heart attacks. And it just recently had a doc a seven bypass heart surgery. Have you ever had a seven bypass? That's how many can you have? A lot. Seven. Uh, he had seven and had given him up for dead on the operating room. And his wife leaned over Miss Hiles and said, "He's in trouble. He's got to have. It looks like he's going to have to have a, 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 a heart transplant." And uh, he, he's in trouble physically. Now, there were these two men, obviously wealthy men. Both of them had a broken heart. Wife had, uh, a businessman's wife, cancer surgery. This doctor, who it seemed like he had almost anything you'd want. This doctor, three heart attacks, seven by heart bypass surgery. And we were chatting one night, and, and I, I, I had fun everywhere I go. In fact, I told Miss Hiles, I said, I'm going to take over the conversation. I'm not going to be intimidated. You watch me. So I started telling him all the funny stories. I told him about that time I was on the broadcast over here, one uh, 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 daily broadcast. I was going off the air saying, Goodbye, God bless you, and Mispa. That means the Lord rest between me and thee while we're absent one the other. And uh, so, Goodbye, God bless you, and Mispa. And then after about three months of saying that every day, I told the folks, Write me a letter and tell me what Mispa means. I'll send you a free book. Then I started saying, Goodbye, God bless you, and Maranatha. And I said that every morning. And it means, Behold, the Lord cometh. And I said that every morning. Every morning, goodbye, God bless you, and Maranatha. Broadcast is at 9 o'clock to 9.30. About 8 o'clock one morning, I had an appointment with a fellow that was on dope. He was hooked on everything. About 9 o'clock, Sandy Popper, my secretary, said, Preacher, your theme is on. You've got to rush in here. I rushed in there and tried to think of something to say for 30 minutes, and I huffed in a puff and went off the air and said, Goodbye, God bless you, and marijuana. I got more mail that day than any time in history of the broadcast. A true story, by the way. And Dr. Jim thought that was so funny. Then I told him my favorite story. And, and i got to tell you this to get the illustration, get the sermon. The illustration this morning, come back tonight, we'll have the sermon. But Dr. Jim was talking, and I said, let me tell you my favorite story. He had, he had told a funny story. Let me tell you my favorite joke. I said, it's one you don't get right away, but it's my favorite joke. I said, a man died. His wife missed him so much she wanted to talk to him. She heard there was a spiritualist church in town where he could take lessons and talk to the departed. She goes down for six weeks. She takes lessons so she can call George and, uh, and, and talk to George. After six weeks out here on, on Calumet and, and the uh, I-80 and the four, uh, anyway, they, they said, you can now talk to your, dead, your husband, your departed husband. She gets in this dark room, and don't forget this is a joke. You're supposed to laugh when I get through. And she gets in this dark room, and she says, George, George. And sure enough, George's voice, hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. George, is that you, George? George, is that you? Yes, Mary, this is me. Oh, George, how are you doing? He said, much better, Mary. He, she said, oh, George, better? Is it better there than it was here with me? Oh, he said, it's much better here than it was with you. Then, George, you are in heaven. No. (laughs) 
I told these two men my favorite story. Every man here is married knows what George is talking about. And, and every man here that laughed at that is going to sleep on the couch tonight, too. And then here's the illustration. Dr. Jim Wolf said, when I get to heaven, boy, did that start on me. He said, when I get to heaven, now here was an Episcopalian man, had martinis. He said, when I get to heaven, he said, the first thing I'm going to do is ask a question to God. And I said, what's the question? And Dr. Jim Wolf said, I'm going to ask God why we have to suffer and struggle on earth. Here's a man, no doubt, was worth millions. Why we had to suffer and struggle. Here's a man, days numbered, probably taking his last vacation. Days numbered. Seven bypass heart surgery, three heart attacks, needs a transplant, maybe he won't live to get the transplant. And he said, when I get to heaven, I think he was a saved man. He, I think he wouldn't have drunk his martinis if some preacher had enough courage to stand up and preach the truth. But, but he talked about prayer. He talked about his surgery, but he said, the first question I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven, why do we have to suffer? and struggle. I didn't answer him, but lingered with me. The next day, Miss Hiles was busy doing something, and I went out of the room, and I walked down to the lobby, atrium, they called it, to do some soul winning, as I did regularly. I went down the atrium, I saw a man down there, had a cane, and he's walking like this, older man, probably 69 years old, nearly 70, ought to be in a rest home. And uh, he sat down gingerly like that, and his face was on one side, was sort of, was paralyzed. I sat down in the chair across from him, and I introduced myself, and I said, Sir, my name is Jack Hiles. He told me his name, and I forgot his name. I said, Do you know if you died today, you'd go to heaven? After I'd talked or chatted a while, I asked him that. And he said, Mister, I'm not a Christian, and I'm not interested. But he said, the thing I'd like to know, if there is a God, why does he make us suffer and struggle? Same question that Jim asked me. Why does he make us suffer and struggle? And sitting there in the atrium of the, the uh, what, what star, princess, ship, I talked to this man who told me he had a serious stroke. And was trying to recover, and the doctor suggested he go on a cruise. Here's what I told him. I said to him, man needs to struggle. And if God does not give man a struggle, man creates his own struggle. I said to him, I said, either, I said, every man struggles. Either a man, God gives him something, to, uh, to, uh, a struggle or suffering to overcome. Man needs to overcome. For example, I was sitting in the lobby of the hotel in, in, in Alaska, and here was a skier over here. They weren't skiing because it, was, it wasn't uh, time, but he was a skier. And we were, we were in a hotel that, that uh, catered to skiers and big mountains all around. And I said, sir, uh, when you ski, what do you do? But there are several folks in the lobby there. And... Uh, he said, I go up there on top of that mountain, and I, I slide down on skis. I said, why? I said, then what do you do? Well, then he said, I get on that chairlift and go back up the top of the mountain. Well, I said, if you wanted to get down to the bottom, why do you go back to the top? He said, I slide down again. I said, sir, I, I'm not the most important, most intelligent man in the world, but I'm no dummy either. What do you want to go back up there for to come down again? He said, I want to slide down again. I said, then what do you do? He said, then I get on the chair, you have to go back up. And I come back down, and I slide. And his life was a series of ups and downs. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. He was creating a struggle. He wanted to struggle and conquer the struggle. If we suffer, we shall also 
conquer and reign. But you don't suffer, you don't conquer. You don't struggle, you don't conquer. You don't fight, you don't win. And man has to struggle. Right there in the same room was a fellow walked in, had a pack on his back, a hotel lobby. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to climb that mountain. I said, here's a guy over here who wants to come down. Now you want to go up. I said, you going to go on skis? He said, you going to go up on skis. I said, you going to carry that big pack on your back? Yeah, I'm going to climb that mountain. I said, what you going to do when you get to the top? He said, get in the ski lift and come back down. I said, then what you going to do? So as soon as I get strength, I'm going to climb back up again. Folks, I got on a, on a, on a what do you call the thing we're on? That thing we rode on? A tram. Got on that tram, went up there. Didn't have to up top that mountain. There's more to the bottom. Here's a guy that was at the top, wanted to get to the bottom, said, so go back to the top, so he'd come down to the bottom, so he'd go back to the top, come down to the bottom. Here's a guy who wants to get to the top, so he can come down to the bottom, and go up to the top, and go to the bottom, and get back down. Now, why? It's stupid. Dumb. Why? Struggle. There's a mountain there. I want to struggle. Why? I want to conquer. I want to do something. I want to accomplish something. I want to overcome a struggle. Both had done the same thing. Both had created a struggle because of man's need to conquer. Ray Young. Ray Young is an idiot. Now let's go to the next point here. You know what Ray Young does for fun? He goes rattlesnake hunting. Man, I run when I see a dead one. We, I, if, I, if I go to the zoo, I won't even go in the snake place. I won't even look at a picture of a snake. I don't even like a worm. I don't like a baby while he's crawling. Anything crawls on his stomach, I don't want to mess with it. Why, in the name of common sense, does Ray Young, he'll get at midnight and 2 o'clock in the morning when he ought to be, I'd rather sleep than hunt for rattlesnakes. Ray Young goes rattlesnake hunting. Why? You think he eats rattlesnake meat? Or wears rattlesnake shorts? No. There is a desire in Ray Young to conquer that rattlesnake. And there is a desire in me to run like Ned from that rattlesnake. But look, everybody in this world, I don't care who you are, you have a desire to overcome a struggle. So some people create their struggles. I continue talking to this man who was in the lobby, about his stroke. And I said, Sir, some people have to create their struggle. The struggle of, okay, there was a guy, I went down to the gym on the ship, they had a gym, gym down there. I went down and worked out. Working out for me is watching the fellows lifting weights. I was tired lifting knife and fork, brother. I, but this guy working out, he, he was... He was having fun. He was, thank you. I can beat that. I said, what you doing? He said, lifting weights. I said, why? He said, cause. I said, what you going to do when you lift it? He said, put some more on the end of it. Dumb. Dumb. I said, what are you trying to do? He said, overcome emphysema. I said, man, I said, I haven't lifted a weight in my life, and I don't have emphysema. I'm better shape than you are. <laughs> now listen to me. There is a desire in every single person's breast to conquer struggle. That's why you ride the rides at the, at the, at the, at the fair and at the carnival and at Six Flags and at Disneyland and Disney World. Everybody in this room, that's why you jog, and that's why you lift weights, and, and that's why the people work for four years to run or lift weights or jump in the Olympic game. Why? A desire to jump higher than anybody else, a desire to run faster than anybody else, a desire to lift more than anybody else, a desire to swim faster than anybody else. That's why little girls, 13, 14 years of age, will go away and, and, and train for four years 
uh, as uh, gymnast, if you please. Why? A desire to conquer. But I said to this man, God's good to some people. God gives to some people a struggle for a purpose. I told him about my mother. With the age of the third grade, nine years old, had to quit school take care of her father because her mother had died and her sister and two brothers. I told him how mother was a housewife at the age of 9, 10, 11, 12. She got married at 17, had a baby at 18. The baby was afflicted, never walked or talked. A spastic child died when she was seven, had a second baby. When she was seven, she also died. And then daddy, the depression came. They lost their little store in little Italy, Texas, town of 1,100 people. And dad turned to liquor. And dad became an alcoholic. And mother struggled to rear a son and a daughter. And uh, she struggled and she struggled. God gave her that struggle. Why did God give her that struggle? Because he wanted her to know the thrill and the joy of victory. That's why. And you'll never know victory till you have a struggle. And that's why rich people that don't have struggles create struggles. And that's why people that don't have burdens create burdens to lift. I told him, I said, my mother sat up there on the third row of our church for years and years and years and heard her boy preach. Saw her daughter in the choir, both of the kids in full-time Christian service. Why? He who doesn't struggle will not know the victory. He who does not suffer will not reign. He that doesn't suffer will not conquer. And some people are so underprivileged, they have to create their own struggle. But to some people, God says, I'll give you a struggle, and that struggle will be for a purpose. I told him about my ministry. I told him I was a pastor. Somebody said, you ought to live such a way that in public, nobody will ever suspicion that you're a preacher. But they'll never be surprised when they find out that you are. I told him I was a preacher. I told him about some of my struggles. Battles that fought. And I said, sir, God has given you a struggle. I said, let me ask you a question. You're on this cruise, right? Yes, sir. I said, how many men do you know that's had a stroke that go on a cruise? He said, none. I said, are you proud of yourself? With half his face, he grinned. The other half was paralyzed. He said, yes, I'm proud of myself. And I said, let me tell you something, my brother. I'm proud of myself, too. He says, wrong to be proud. Okay, nobody's perfect. But I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I thank God that I stood some tests. But I couldn't have stood the test if I didn't have some tests. I thank God I've seen some victories, but I couldn't have had the victory if I didn't have any battles. If we suffer, we shall also reign together. So this morning, if you're suffering and struggling, and God has given you a struggle, thank God you're struggling for a cause. You don't have to create an improvised, synthetic struggle like climbing a mountain, lifting some stupid weights, sliding on skis down to the bottom so you can go back to the top so you can slide down again. God comes to a Martin Evans and says, I want to I wanna give you a weight. You don't have to index some. God said, I want to give you a struggle. I want to give you some suffering. Why? Because one is, there is something inside you, Marlene, that makes you want to struggle. If you don't believe that, ask Dr. Evans. But there's something inside you. And if you don't have a struggle that has a purpose to it, my mother struggled because God gave her the struggle. And she saw the reward of two children in full-time Christian service. And I have struggled and Mrs. Hiles has struggled. And we're glad we did because God's given us victories over the struggle. And some people have to spend a lot of money and climb out and come down on skis or lift some weights. Thank God today I don't have to look for struggles that bring no rewards. God's given me struggles that bring rewards. So, if God has given you a struggle, you're the fortunate one. Ask you a question. Who was the lucky one? I hate to use the word lucky, but you know what I mean. Who was the lucky one? My mother? Or the fellow about climbing that mountain? Both struggled. Mother struggled for a purpose. 
He struggled in a synthetic effort. He had to overcome. I like the song those young people sing, the Overcomers Ensemble. And I'm not a Martin Luther King Jr. fan or a Jesse Jackson fan, but I like that song, We Shall Overcome. We shall overcome. I like the word, the, the nickname, if you please, of the City Baptist Bus Kids School, the City Baptist Hammond City Baptist High School. Overcomers, but you can't overcome until you struggle. Sitting there in that chair, the atrium of the Star Princess cruise ship. I told the man the most wonderful story ever told. I cannot read his heart to know if he's sincere or not, but I can hear his voice as he prayed the sinner's prayer. And I can hear him as he said to me, I said, where would you go if you died now? And he said, I'd go to heaven. I'd ask a question, sir. Suppose your struggle had been invented to climb a mountain. Would you have been on this ship? No. Would you have heard the gospel? Would you have trusted Christ as your Savior? No. I said, you're the lucky one. You're the lucky one. There are people here who would never take time to listen to the gospel. You know why? Because they're having too much fun creating and inventing struggles. I say there is in the best of every single man and woman and child in America, in the world, a desire to overcome. And we have to have a struggle. We have to have a challenge, something to overcome. Either you create your own, or God gives you one. And the one that you create offers no reward. But the one that God gives you offers eternal reward. So God has given you a struggle. You're the blessed one. You don't have to create your own struggle. God gave you one. This morning... You carry a burden, thank God for it. You have the opportunity. I want to give you a little statement as I was made. I don't think I ever told you this. I hate to even bring the subject up, but back when our big battle came, Mrs. Hiles stood beside me like a rock of Gibraltar. And she said one day, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. I'm not going to miss opportunity, fight, battle, struggle, heartache, burden. Why, sure, every burden that God gives you is an opportunity for you to win. If we suffer, we shall also reign and conquer. So, tell me, who's the most blessed? The ones who sit in the comfort this morning with no struggle? I look all over this room. I cannot look at any place in this room without looking at people who struggle. Struggle to live. Struggle to get well. Struggle to support the family. Struggle over heartache. Struggle, struggle over heartbreak. But they're the ones who can look in the mirror and say, you made it. I looked in the mirror this morning. I knew I was going to preach on and I said, you're getting old. I'm looking at an old man, I said. Talk out loud to myself. You do that when you get my age. A slobber. I said, as I looked at myself through the mirror, I said, you're getting old. I said, you're not able to cover your head up with what little hair you got like you used to. And I said, you got this chicken neck here. Got crow's feet up here and your jaws are flapping a little bit here. But I pointed at myself in the mirror, knowing what I was going to preach on, I said, I want to tell you, you're a man. You're a man. You're an old man, but a man. A man who struggled. A man who's had burdens. A man who's had heartaches. But a man that's still going. Like Robertson said, Jack Hiles is a survivor. 
I don't know of any greater joy than to struggle and survive. This morning, if you have burdens and heartaches, look up to God and say, Hallelujah. If you're suffering, struggling, look up to God and say, Well, glory! I don't have to ski. I don't have to climb a mountain. I don't have to lift weights. Bless God, He's chosen to give to me a struggle from heaven with heaven's strength and heaven's reward. Tell me, Tell me, the skier or my mother? The mountain climber or Marty Nevins? Tell me, who's the most blessed? One fights to create a synthetic struggle so he can conquer. And one is given by God a struggle so he through Christ can conquer with rewards eternally. My heart's heavy this morning. I love Russell Eddy. Man who stood on a pulpit committee when I came. A man who stuck by me in every kind of a battle under the sun. A man who never ceases to smile every time he sees his preacher. I hurt this morning. I hurt because of many of our people. Who are suffering. But let me tell you, hallelujah, that God has given us the privilege and the ministry to suffer. That's why we don't have to climb mountains or lift weights. Because many of us have been given by God a divine struggle planned in heaven so we could overcome and receive rewards eternally. Would you bow your heads, please?